Well, hello. Good morning. Welcome. It's great to see so many of you here on our campus. Let me welcome everybody joining us online. If we haven't met, my name's Adam, one of the pastors here. Glad you're here. Week two of a teaching series called Now is the Time. Now, if you call Bond Forest home, you've heard this phrase now for a couple of months. If you're just jumping in today, if it's your first time with us, if you're a guest, welcome. We are honored you're here. Let me tell you what we've been talking about now since about the middle of November. We entered into a special season, those of us who call Vaughn Forest home, of sacrificial giving and a now is the time special offering towards five ministry initiatives for 2023. So uh, those who call Vaughn Forest home have been giving since November. We set a goal of $200,000 uh, to fully fund these five initiatives. And uh, we're giving our church family till the end of January to sacrificially give. Now, what we're doing in the month of January is we're coming in here and we're talking about each one of those initiatives each week uh, biblically. Why is it that we think God's calling us to this? And then from a perspective of vision, what is that then going to look like in this new year as we step into these initiatives? And so we got that kicked off last week. If you missed last week's message, we talked about launching our brand new VF Buddy Special Needs Ministry. Super excited about that. I would encourage you to go back and catch that at some point this week. But let me tell you what we're going to talk about today. It's the second initiative in our special offering, and uh, it is simply this, that now is the time to upgrade our fourth and fifth grade life group rooms in our next generation ministry environment. So our church has been growing by God's grace, and because many of y'all keep inviting your friends, and we love that, and it's been fantastic. But where we've really seen that growth the most is in our elementary ministry area. We kind of call it our kids' ministry here. Where we've seen it most specifically in that particular ministry area is with fourth and fifth graders. And so it became obvious to us Back about the beginning of October, middle of October, we gotta do something about this. We're kind of outgrowing our existing space that we've given them for life groups. And uh, we decided to make that one of the initiatives. But I wanted you to hear from some of the folks who are on the front lines uh, leading this ministry area who are ministering to these fourth and fifth graders every single week as they kind of describe the growth, describe the, all that God has been doing, and describe the, the need that we saw in this ministry area. So take a look at this video. Hey Vaughn Forest, one of the things that I love the most about being here at Vaughn Forest Church is our focus on the next generation. And let me tell you something, we have a lot of next generation here at Vaughn Forest Church. And going into 2023, one of the initiatives of our Now is a Time special offering was to help equip, resource, and redo a couple of the rooms for our fourth and fifth graders because they are absolutely packing out the rooms they have now. And so I was so excited this past week to get to sit down with a few folks that serve in our Next Generation Ministries talk about the need that exists there and talk about how we as a Vaughn Forest Church are going to respond to this need, how we're going to equip those rooms and get ready for those fourth and fifth graders so they can bring even more and more of their friends. So check out this video and see how you can get involved with our Now is the Time special offering as we support the next generation here at Vaughn Forest Church. We have seen uh, about 30% growth in our kids' ministry, birth through fifth grade. Specifically, fourth and fifth grade has exploded. Kids are inviting their friends. They are really connected into what we're doing and they love their volunteer leaders. We have six rooms on our second floor where we host our elementary through fifth grade kids and then we have one large group room. And so right now, our fourth and fifth graders, um, we split them into girls and boys and so they each have their own space. Space. What that looks like is our girls are in this tiny little room. Um, we typically have between 20 to 22 girls crammed in this room. You know, there's there's not enough seating. There's not enough space. I've got children sitting up on the windowsill. It was like cats all over each other. And it was hard to get them to settle and listen and hear. We um, have found two new spaces, much larger, right below our current kids space where our fourth and fifth graders are gonna move to, um, still separate, boys and girls. And man, we are creating a really cool environment because what we've learned with fourth and fifth graders is they're not so much little kids anymore, but they're not teenagers. There's kind of that in between. They wanna be more grown up. And so we wanna create a space for them that feels like that, that feels more like student ministry. Think like big tables, couches, hangout space, but still, especially for boys, um, foosball tables, basketball, air hockey, fun things for them to connect with each other with, but then still have that good small group meaningful time. 
I think it's really important. Uh, the, the idea of having these new rooms and giving these, these children more space is, is paramount. Our kids now, they just learn so differently. So it's important to have different ways to reach them and to be able to sit and have a conversation with them. And right now, that's, that's very hard. The Lord has brought us some really incredible volunteers who um, have these just incredible conversations with these kids. They are pouring into them each and every week. Like no other generation, they are growing up faster than ever before, just with the internet and social media. And our volunteers, our prayer is that the Lord is, is using them in a big way. And just the conversations that they are able to have with those kids is just incredible. You know, just with our three boys, we can say things to them, but when Jacob's small group leader says something to him. It might be the same thing myself or Adam has mentioned, but man, it lands differently when his small group leaders are, you know, talking about these real world things with him. And so we are just so thankful. If this can be done in the small space that they have, I can't even imagine what can happen in a larger space. It isn't like it's gonna be underutilized. Every time that there's any growth, opportunity, any changes, it seems that the church takes it and uses it effectively and efficiently. I think that it's gonna give the kids an opportunity, number one, to, to bring in their friends. You know, it's gonna make it a little bit more interactive. I love the idea, you know, that we're gonna have an area to be able to do crafts and to, and to be able to open up our Bibles instead of, you know, you open it in this corner and you open it over there, or, you know, we're gonna share. It's gonna give us a little bit more space. I mean, we're decking out these rooms to make these girls and these guys just be like, wow, this is a really cool space. I wanna be a part of it and I wanna bring my friends. So uh, grateful for those guys sitting down and recording uh, the video. And um, there was a little bit of footage where they kind of went through and, and showed what the new uh, life groups rooms are going to look like. So the floors have been replaced and the walls have been painted. The furniture has been ordered. Some of y'all coming up here this weekend and going to put that, uh, not this weekend, this week and put that together. And I don't know if you could tell because the video was kind of quick. The, the walls in these new rooms for the life group rooms, there was a shiplap wall. Now, when you were in the fourth or fifth grade, did you even know what shiplap was? I mean, let's be honest. We didn't know what shiplap was until a decade ago when when Chip and Joanna, by God's grace, started putting shiplap on everything, right? Now we got to have shiplap. So we got fourth and fifth graders with stinking shiplap, right? So that's going to be kind of cool. Really fun environment. Like they said, it's going to um, really make that life group space uh, function more like it's supposed to, which is an environment where they can have life-changing conversations. So again, just know that when you give to the special offering, part of what you give is going to go to that. But what I wanted to do today because we're talking about fourth and fifth grade life group space. Chad was already out here talking about life groups. We're kicking off life group signups today. Many of you are already in a life group. Um, some of you are considering, do I wanna get in a life group this spring semester? We've got a whole life group info table set up out here in the lobby. The question that I wanted to answer today quite simply is this, why life groups? Why life groups? Like, Why is it that in our elementary ministry that you just heard about, we structure the time where the teaching time sets up the life group time. Why is it that in our student ministry, we, we structure the time where the teaching time sets up the life group time? Why is it that we take several times a year as a church to strategically focus on life groups and encourage you to join a life group? And I think sometimes what we do in leadership in the church is, is we do a, a decent job of saying, you know, here's what we're doing. Here's what we're offering. Sometimes we forget to kind of pause and say, here's why. Here's why, biblically speaking, we believe that this matters. So there's some message notes in your bulletin. I want you to go ahead and grab those if you're here on our campus. If you're joining us online, you can access those message notes right here at vaughnforest.com. We're gonna look at some commitments today that I think are gonna help kind of frame why life groups are so important. But before we get to those commitments, I wanna lay a foundation. Biblically speaking, why do life groups matter? Why are life groups important? I didn't put these in your notes, but you might wanna jot down maybe a few of the principles somewhere along the way, okay? So these are kind of some longer principles, but just kind of hang here with me for a second because I used several different phrases. And the reason why is because I've heard all these phrases used, okay? So let's roll with this for a second. Spiritual growth and or maturity and or discipleship and or growing in Christ-likeness and or sanctification. These are all phrases used to describe spiritual growth. And you probably have a phrase that you like to use. Now, if you've never heard the word sanctification, that's just a big fancy word for growing in holiness. But here's what I want you to see. All of these things, pick your favorite phrase. Let's just go with discipleship, okay? Let's go with discipleship. Discipleship is commanded for all. And this is kind of the real big 
focus of this foundational point, all Christians in the New Testament. We've lost this somewhere along the way. Somewhere along the way, not intentionally, not because anybody said, hey, let's all do this. Just kind of the culture, just kind of the air we breathe. Discipleship, spiritual maturity, spiritual growth started to feel like something for the spiritually elite, for maybe those who have been Christians for a long time, maybe those who have been in church a long time. And, and, then, and then kind of the rest of us, yeah, we kind of get around to it when we can. But what I want you to see from the New Testament is it's actually not just suggested, it's commanded for all Christians that the moment you experienced salvation, the moment you were born again, the moment you were saved, whatever phrase you want to describe the experience where you recognize that you are a sinner in need of a savior and you ask Jesus to come in and be your way, the only way to God, to be reconciled to God, the only way to be promised heaven for all of eternity. When you came to that point, and you recognize that, and you experience salvation, that was the starting point of your discipleship. That all of spiritual life, walking with the Lord, is all of spiritual growth, and it's actually something that's commanded for all of us in the New Testament. Here's the second kind of foundational principle. I'm gonna use all my phrases again. Spiritual growth and or maturity and or discipleship and or growing in Christ likeness and or sanctification cannot happen absent from relationships with other Christians. Okay, do you see the connection there? So if this is what we're called to, this is what we're commanded to do, we can't do this absent from relationships with one another. This is why the one another passages are all over the New Testament. They're all over the New Testament. One year in college, I didn't have a roommate. So I went to a small Christian college, and so there were lots of different things happening on campus, and we were sitting in Bible classes, and, and so spiritual growth was kind of part of what was, you know, suggested for a lot of us here on campus, and there was this one year in college, I didn't have a roommate, and I still lived on a hall in a dorm with a bunch of guys, but I didn't have a roommate, and by the end of that year, I had convinced myself, man, I've really grown a lot in my faith this year, but in hindsight, I hadn't really grown that much, I had just kind of isolated myself a little bit. And if you're in isolation, sometimes you can convince yourself you're growing when in reality, you're really not. Now here's what's interesting about the relationships that facilitate spiritual growth in the body of a church. They're made up of brothers and sisters. Now I don't know how many of y'all had brothers and sisters growing up, but if you had brothers and sisters growing up, let me tell you the word to describe that, friction. I mean, if we wanna be real, we might say even fighting, right? You got brothers and sisters, you're gonna butt heads a little bit. You got brothers and sisters, there's gonna be some friction. If you've got brothers and sisters, you may fight with them, but if somebody fights them, now they're gonna fight you, right? Because you're gonna get your brothers and sisters back. That's kind of how that works. It's really no different in a church family. Now, we don't encourage fighting in the lobby after the services, but what I'm trying to say here is sometimes in the fellowship and in the relationships, in a spiritual family, there can be a little bit of friction, why? to refine the rough edges of our lives. It takes a little bit of friction sometimes, and so the relationships are actually where the spiritual growth starts to happen. Now, how does all that tie in into life groups? Let's get the third principle up here. The goal of life groups is to provide a place for these types of relationships to form so that spiritual growth and or maturity and or discipleship and or growing in Christlikeness and or sanctification can happen. That's the goal. The goal of a life group is to provide a place for those types of relationships. You say, what do you mean? The types of relationships that produce spiritual growth. And a lot of times people have tried life groups or they've gotten into a group or maybe they did something in the past and they think, well, I didn't really enjoy it. It, was, it wasn't what I was looking for. It, it wasn't as much fun as I was anticipating. And perhaps the reason why the group didn't deliver is because the expectations weren't set on the front end. Do we hope you have fun in life groups? Absolutely. Do we hope that it's something that's enjoyable? Of course. But is the goal of a life group to have fun? No. Is the goal of a life group to experience community? No. Is the goal of the life group to allow relationships to take place that produce spiritual growth? Yes. So what I wanna spend the rest of our time talking about then today are seven commitments. Now, these are commitments that show up in any life group. Seven commitments that facilitate spiritual growth in a life group. Now, these are in your message notes. So this is what we're going to walk through here. Let me tell you why. Whether you are a fourth or fifth grader, whether you're a student or student ministry, or whether you're in a life group as an adult, these are the commitments that if the people that are in the group will make to one another, 
the group has a chance to produce spiritual growth in the life of the members of the group. So again, if you're in a group, or if your kids are in a group, or if your teenagers are in a group, which if your teenagers are in a student ministry right now, they break off into groups, they're gonna see these commitments show up as well. Because as we make these commitments to one another in the group, like I said, it will produce spiritual growth. So let's walk through these, right? Each principle will have a verse that we'll get to in a second. We'll talk about the principle uh, before we get to the verse. Here's the first commitment, be consistent, not sporadic. If the people in the group are consistent in their participation in the group, the group can produce spiritual growth. Now, that doesn't mean perfect attendance. Sometimes people go, I can't get into a group because I already know we're gonna be out of town. I already know my kids got something this week. We get it. That's called life. Everybody has life. Perfect attendance is not a requirement. But what is going to facilitate spiritual growth is making it a priority. Is making it a priority. What I tell people is if you get into a life group, put that on your calendar first and let everything else revolve around it. But if you're not consistently participating in the group, you're not gonna grow. I mean, it's January. How many of us have joined a gym in January? You don't have to raise your hand, okay? But if you join a gym in January and you only go twice during January, that's better than not going at all, don't, don't, okay? But it's probably not gonna give you the results you're looking for. Why? Lack of consistency. Now, we understand that principle when it comes to our physical health. It's really the same when it comes to our spiritual health. So look at what Hebrews says about this. Just the consistent nature of being together. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. It's a habit. It's a habit to be together. It's a habit you have to be intentional about. And it's a habit that if you consistently are together, it will produce spiritual growth, okay? Second commitment. If you're gonna be in a group, here's the second commitment. Be real, not fake. Be real. If you sign up for a group and you get in a group and you go to group every week and you're never real, you're never authentic, you're never vulnerable from time to time, it's not gonna do you any good. Now, I speak from personal experience, okay? So if you call Vaughn Forrest home, you've heard this story before. If you're new to Vaughn Forrest, let me air a little bit of my dirty laundry, okay? So Morgan and I, we celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary on January 3rd. We've talked about this multiple times. We were interviewed on stage talking about this. We did a marriage event in the fall. We talked about this. So this is no big secret. The first three years of our marriage were hard. They were hard. In hindsight, it's because we were both incredibly selfish, incredibly self-centered. We didn't put Christ at the center of our marriage. We put ourselves at the center of our marriage. That's a formula for disaster. We had a lot of intense fellowship. That's how you say fighting very spiritually, okay? That's how that went down. And we had to have some marriage counselors help us get back on the right track. And by God's grace, that started to happen. And we celebrate that. And we try to share part of our story to encourage you. Hey, if you're going through a tough season in your marriage, there's hope, okay? But let me tell you what was happening in that season. And this is the real embarrassing part. We were in a life group. We were in a life group with other married couples talking about marriage every single week. And these other married couples were awesome. They were super friendly. They loved Jesus. They loved us. Some of them we're still friends with to this day. Now, again, this was many, many years ago. But we're talking about marriage every single week, and we're in our group. And I just realized one week, like, Adam, you're being a total fraud. You're not being real. And so one week in the middle of the conversation, I just blurted this out. I blurted this out. I was a, I was a student pastor at the time, and I just blurted this out in our group. I said, I don't know about y'all, but our marriage, it stinks. Now, I got a real funny look from Morgan about that time. She's like, I guess we're about to do this, aren't we? I was like, here we go, right? And it got quiet for about a second. And then can I tell you what happened? All those couples started encouraging us. All of those couples started praying for us. And, and, and we started kind of starting to talk about the real things. And from that point forward, our marriage started to get better. And what's interesting about that is that God had brought us people into our lives that could help us if we would just be real. And once we got real, the group started helping us, okay? So I'm not telling you you gotta turn every life group into Dr. Phil. I mean, we don't have to do that. But what I am saying is, is if you can't at least be honest about what's going on, it's probably not gonna produce spiritual growth. Now, how do you do that? I have found that the best way, and let me encourage you, the best way to be real about what's happening in your life, listen, is to let God's word show you what's really going on in your life. Did you know that's one of the things that God's word does? Let's go back to Hebrews. Look at this passage, it's really helpful. For the word of God is alive and active. The Bible is unlike any other book. Okay, it's not like you can read a lot of books written by a lot of Christian authors. That's fantastic. Nothing replaces reading God's word. It's like no other book. It's alive and active. 
It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And look at what God's word does. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Isn't that interesting? So let me encourage you, when you sit down and read God's word, say, hey God, could you use your word to show me, judge the thoughts and the attitudes of my heart? God, what's really going on beneath the surface? What's driving my behaviors? What's driving my tone? What's driving my short temper? Can I tell you, God will be faithful to answer that prayer. Maybe not in one setting, but consistently over time. If you ask him to use his word to show you what's really happening up here and what's really happening in here, he will do that. Now, here's where the group becomes helpful. You can go to a group and you can say, can I share, share with you guys some of the things I believe that God's been showing me? And the group can begin to help you grow in your faith, okay? So start with God's word. Let God's word show you what's going on and then be real, be, be open, be authentic with the members in your group. Here's the third commitment. If you're gonna be in a life group, you wanna produce spiritual growth, be humble. Be humble, not arrogant, okay? So let's just say for a second that, that you're in a group and somebody speaks up and says something like I did all those years ago, like our marriage stinks. Like don't be the guy who says, well, you know what? By God's grace, our marriage is just nothing but perfect. Let me share a few bro- verses with you, brother. Don't be that guy, okay? Nobody wants to hear from that guy, okay? Maybe you do have some things that could help. The timing of how you communicate that is important, okay? You may be in a group with somebody and they share something that's theologically incorrect. And you may know, that's not true. That's not theologically correct. Should that be corrected? Sure. But how it's corrected really matters. And the humility that we bring to a group matters, okay? There's a translation of the Bible called The Message. I reference it, I don't know, three or four times a year. It's written by Eugene Peterson. He's now with the Lord. And what he was trying to do was capture kind of the essence of the the New Testament Greek that was written and maybe kind of the street language of the day, how the uneducated would have spoken and just kind of understood one another. And so every now and then I like to reference it because I think it kind of captures the heart of, of some passages. So let me read you a passage from Romans 14 from The Message that kind of captures this point of what it looks like to be humble with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Look what he says, and apply this to being in a group. Welcome with open arms fellow believers who don't see things the way you do, and don't jump all over them every time they do or say something that you don't agree with. That's helpful. Even when it seems, I love this, that they are strong on opinions but weak in the faith department. Now, don't point, okay? But like, isn't that true, right? You've been in a group with somebody real strong on opinions. I don't know what that's based upon, but they're real strong on opinions. He's saying, hey, okay, that happens. But listen at this. Remember, they have their own history to deal with. Treat them gently. I think he captures the essence of what Paul was communicating to this new church, new Christians, new believers. And can I encourage you, if you're in a group with individuals, the one thing I know about everybody in that group, they've got their own history they're dealing with. They got things in their past too. They're still carrying some weight. We all are walking through life carrying burdens. And here's the, here's the thing. We're trying to figure out who we can actually let in on that. That's what we're all trying to do. And so many times in church, that's the place that everybody feels like they can't let people in on that. And that's actually why God gave us the church is so that we can let people in on those things. But if you're in a group and somebody is doing that, remember, they've got their own history. Treat them gently, be humble, be loving, be caring, be accepting, and you can be the person that God uses to maybe help bring some direction, maybe help bring some correction. Whatever it is that's needed in their life, God can use you, but only if the people in the group are being humble as they serve one another. Here's the next commitment to make if you're gonna be in a life group that produces spiritual growth. And this is my favorite one of the day. Might get me a little bit of trouble. Be honest, not nice. Now, who thought you were gonna come to church today and hear the pastor tell you not to be nice, okay? So let's unpack what we're talking about here. Sometimes in our efforts to be nice, we miss an opportunity to help one another. Sometimes we just don't wanna step on anybody's toes. We don't wanna hurt anybody's feelings. We don't wanna be rude. We we don't wanna be taken the wrong way. And so everything just kind of stays at a surface level. We just never get honest with each other. 
Now, there's a right way to be honest with each other, and there's a wrong way to be honest with each other. But, but let's just kind of talk things out here for a second. If you're in a group, and let's just say there's a couple in the group, and, and they're named Bob and Mary. I'm just making stuff up, right? And let's just say Bob keeps kind of speaking pretty pretty mean, pretty harsh to like Mary in the group, like taking shots at Mary, cutting Mary down. Everybody can tell like Mary's kind of getting her feelings hurt, but Bob, you know, doesn't notice this. Like at some point, somebody's got to take Bob behind the woodshed. No, that's not what needs to happen. At some point, somebody's got to point that out to Bob. Hey, Bob, man, you may not see this, but when you say stuff like that, it really hurts your wife's feelings. Now, is the time to do that in the middle of the group? Not unless you want to see fireworks fly. So like, I would not suggest that, okay? It might be better to do that like at another time over coffee. Hey, Bob, no judgment here, man. We, we all got our things. But here's an observation I've made in, your, in our group. When you say these things, it kind of hurts Mary's feelings. Can I tell you what that is? That's being honest, not nice. That's being honest, not nice. Can I tell you something that's true about you and it's true about me and none of us like to admit it? We all have blind spots. Do you know what a blind spot is? A blind spot is something about your life that by definition, you don't see. You're blind to it. One of the reasons God brings brothers and sisters in Christ in our life is to point out our blind spots. But if everybody's just focused on being nice and no one's ever honest with each other about their blind spots, no spiritual growth takes place. Have you ever had somebody point out a blind spot to you? It's terrible. Like I've had people point out blind spots to me. It's like, Adam, I don't know if you see this, but this is a blind spot of yours. And I'm like, no, could never be. And they point this out to me. And then I'll go to somebody who like is a really good friend. I'll be like, hey man, you won't believe this. So-and-so said that this was a blind spot. And my friend will look at me and be like, you didn't know? I'm like, I need new friends. Like, so well, what are we talking about here, right? It's like, no, I didn't know. And you didn't tell me? Like, well, I didn't wanna hurt your feelings because you're being nice, okay? We have to speak lovingly to one another and point out the blind spots. Do it the right way. And here's the thing. If somebody points out a blind spot to you, that means they love you. That means they care about you. Isn't it true that all of us can be our own worst enemy? I mean, isn't it true that many times we're the ones that are actually getting in the way of our spiritual growth? We're getting in the way of our marriages getting better. We're getting in the way of becoming better parents or grandparents. But if we don't have people in our lives who love us enough to just shoot us straight and say, hey man, here's a blind spot that you need to refine in your spiritual growth by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're never gonna grow in our faith. And here's, here, here's the thing, okay? This is actually the normative way spiritual growth is presented in the New Testament. Shocking, I know. Like we think, really? Like this is what we're supposed to do? Yes, we're supposed to do this for one another. Now, if we passed around a microphone and did it in the service, wouldn't that be interesting, okay? So we're not gonna do this like in a large setting. No, you do this with 10, 12, 15 people who you get to know, they get to know you. You don't take shots at one another. You do it lovingly, but that's part of what spiritual growth looks like. Okay, look at this verse. This is helpful from Proverbs. An honest answer is the sign of a true friendship. Someone asks you a question. Hey, you, do, do you want me to tell you what I'm supposed to say because I think we're supposed to be nice? Or do you want me to tell you the truth because I love you? Let me give you an honest answer because I love you. Th that's what I'm talking about. Is there a right way to do it? Of course, is there a wrong way to do it? Yes, don't do it the wrong way. But if we're not honest with one another, nobody's gonna grow in their faith, okay? Here we go, next commitment. This is fun, right? Be trustworthy, not a gossip. Be trustworthy. If you're gonna be in a group with people, you gotta be trustworthy. Somebody shares something in the group, it stays in the group. Somebody shares a prayer request in the group. You don't share the prayer request on Facebook, okay? Yes, I've seen that happen before, okay? You keep it in the group. You're trustworthy. Did you know that Satan destroys more churches simply by gossip? So many times Christians are actually, I know this is a pretty harsh phrase, but this is heavy, serious stuff. Christians can become tools that are being used by the enemy to destroy a church and they don't even see it. Why? Because they can't keep their mouth shut. Because they're gossiping. And nothing will destroy the unity of a church faster than gossip. So if you're gonna be in a group, the commitment you gotta make to one another is to be trustworthy. Scripture has all kinds of things to say about this. I chose one verse from Proverbs. A troublemaker plants seeds of strife. Gossip separates the best of friends. I've seen it, you've seen it too that gossip can literally separate the best of friendships. It can happen anywhere. So if you're gonna meet a group, if you're gonna facilitate spiritual growth, you gotta be trustworthy. Let me give you the next commitment. 
There's seven of them. We're almost done. Number seven, be available. Be available. Not too busy. Saying that you're busy is kind of a cop-out. Like everybody's busy. In fact, the people I know that are most committed to being in life groups are some of the busiest people I know. Okay? Being available means that you're actually available to the people in your group. What does that mean? If somebody in your group gets in a car wreck and they have to be taken to the hospital, somebody from your group is on the way to meet them at the hospital. You're not too busy for that. No, no, no. Life just through an emergency. I mean, you're, you're going to create one of those meal trains where you send out the link, everybody signs up. We're, you know, we're going to bring chicken pot pie next Wednesday night. Everybody's doing that instantaneously. You're going. You're dropping everything. You're available. These are the people you're there for. And you can get in hospitals now. It's great. So like, you know, a few years ago during the pandemic, you know, you couldn't go see people in hospitals. You can do that now. Okay? I, I just went to a hospital a couple weeks ago. See one of our members. You walk right in, you sign in, they give you the name, the high, they don't give you high five, but they kind of look at you and smile and that's good enough. And you go on in and you talk to them, you pray with them, you can do that. You're in a life group with somebody and their, and their car breaks down and they're down one vehicle. You say, no worries, we'll run carpool this week. Let's go. And you figure out how to make it happen. You're in a life group with somebody and they have a special you know, situation that pops up and they're not really sure what to do or, or any, anything. So the way that a church this size provides that type of availability is through our life groups. We got a lot of people who call Vaughn Forest home. If you're not connected to a life group and something happens in your life, the availability who could, of a person who could be there to help you the time increases if you're not connected into a group. We have a really small staff and a really big church, and we love everybody, and I love you as your pastor. But if I'm the person who has to be available, there might be a little bit of a waiting period. I'm just being honest, okay? But, but if you're in a group, it, it, it reduces that. And that's actually how the church was set up to function, is for us to be available to one another. But there's gotta be a pragmatic side to how we actually go about doing that. And for us, that is through our life groups, okay? So let's look at our biblical passage that guides us. Galatians 6.2. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. If you're walking through life and you've got a burden, you've got an emergency situation, you've got something that you're trying to deal with, and you don't have people there to carry that with you, it's gonna weigh you down, and it's gonna keep you from experiencing what God wants you to experience in your spiritual growth. And here's the last commitment to make. If you want to be in a life group that facilitates spiritual growth, be unified. Be unified. Don't let secondary things divide a group. You could be in a life group with people who vote differently than you. Now, I don't suggest making that a discussion at group, okay? You could be in a group of people who have a different background than you, different life experiences than you. We're not into uniformity, Uniformity is cookie cutter Christians. Uniformity is everybody being the same, looking the same, acting the same. No, no, that, that, that's not the New Testament. The New Testament is a bunch of people from different backgrounds who were unified through the salvation they'd experienced in Jesus Christ and the fellowship they were experiencing with one another. So we're unified. We're unified because of Jesus. We're unified because of what he's done for us and we're unified through the love that he's given us for one another. Look what Paul commands to the church at Corinth about this in 1 Corinthians. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church, rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Our unity matters. Our unity matters to God. Our unity matters to a world that's looking for hope. Our unity is one of the greatest testimonies that we can give to people who don't yet know Jesus. So do you wanna grow in your faith? I hope so. I hope you see that all of life is a journey of just taking the next step of spiritual growth that God has before you. And if you're not connected to a group of people, and many of you already are, but if you are not connected to a group of people, I would encourage you, don't let another 90 days go by without making that decision. If you are connected to a group of people, maybe a little bit of a reset. Hey guys, we all love each other. Hey, we all enjoy each other's company, but let's make sure that the purpose of our fellowship is actually to help us grow in our faith. Would you bow your head with me as we pray this morning and call upon God to give us the strength to do that? And so God, as we come to you right now in prayer, that is our prayer. 
that, that we want to become more like Jesus. We want to experience spiritual growth. We want to grow in our sanctification by the power of the Holy Spirit. But part of declaring that desire is recognizing the mechanism you've given us to make that happen, and that's one another. And so, God, for many of us, that requires a new level of priority, a new level of commitment, a new level of availability. And God, I just pray that in this season, as we're all kind of looking at our schedules and we're looking at the next few months and we're kind of looking at this new semester and we're trying to figure out what our kids have to do and that, that we would carve out the time for the relationships in our life that will produce spiritual growth, that will help us become more like Jesus, that, that we would put others before ourselves, that we would be humble as we serve each other. So Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for what we're seeing happening in our groups with our children, with our teenagers, with our adults. And Lord, we just ask that you would continue to do that in a way that you receive glory from it. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Adam. What a great message.